Okay, want to get started? Let's get started. All right, we're going to get started. Um, I'm Brad Topol, this is Rocky Grover. Hiding somewhere is Catherine Dieppe. Tong Lee also hiding, but um, uh, here, here to talk about RefStack and Beyond, the Interop Challenge. And we're going to start with a brief overview of RefStack. Go ahead. So, um, yeah. RefStack, a, a lot of people, when we talk about interoperability, uh, we, for OpenStack, we associate with DevCore RefStack. So, we w just want to clearly define what, where RefStack and DevCore, what are the difference, and wh why do we go on beyond to interop challenge. So, RefStack itself is a tool set for uh, for interop, uh, OpenStack interoperability testing. Um, and, and the criteria is testing today is based on what we call a, a DEF core guideline. Um, with that guideline, the test result was checked against that guideline and, and will give a status pass or fail. So pretty much uh, the definition of interoperability today, testing by RefStack, is defined by DEF core. And um, the, the focus on RefSec is mostly on uh, API tests at this moment. It see API is the foundation layer for whatever tool, uh, uh, Ansible, Shake, uh, whatever, Cloud Foundry tool that use on top of that. So uh, it makes sure that whatever the foundation uh, API as defined by DevCore is being enforced by whatever vendor cloud that you are uh, using. Um, and uh, mo all the tests that te uh, using RefStack tests, the result will be sending up in a public place. And I have the link here. Uh, if you go to the link today, you, you go to the community result section, then you will see a lot of the result today being sent up there as anonymous. So that is what RefStack uh, is testing. It is the base layer defined, the base API that uh, at this moment DevCore thinks that it is important for interact. And uh, to go beyond that, that is the uh, interact challenge that Rocky will go through. And uh, the interrupt challenge, uh, IBM actually challenged the community of vendors to demonstrate that all these different vendor clouds could actually work from a, with a single application and everyone could, could load up this application and it would just work. And we saw the results on Tuesday. We saw 16 of the folks of the 18 that actually made it uh, in time for Barcelona. It's more of a holistic approach that is more of a scenario type of thing, much closer to what the end user actually goes through when it, they're trying to use the clouds. And so by demonstrating that these clouds can do this, you have a template, you have an example, you have a way for folks to, instead of having to start from scratch, they can actually start from working and modify it to work for their, their needs. Uh, there are, the, this is, the, these are enterprise apps, so it's what the users want for their enterprises, not the operators. This is definitely end user focused. We are, so far, this first phase was let's get something working. But now that it's been so successful, we plan on moving forward with this, rolling more apps in. We already have plans for Docker Swarm. Uh, some folks have already passed that. We're working through the issues there. We're working on NFE, actually, Tong is, Tong Lee is the guy who's doing most of the heavy lifting here. And we will work with the foundation to incentivize vendors to participate and keep the apps up to date 
and working on their clouds and tested on their clouds by working with the foundation to have these apps from the Interop Challenge actually be in the app catalog and every vendor who passes these, who, who actually does work with these without modification, will be identified with these particular apps so that users can go and say, this is the app I want, which vendors do I uh, pass it? And they can do their collection of vendors so they know that their multi-cloud functionality will work the way they design it. Uh, we also plan on identifying new apps as, as the user surveys demonstrate. I think we just, just, just 20 minutes ago identified Cloud Foundry as a critical app. And we will have a grown collection which will make this much more usable for everybody. Um, overview, we've got the Docker Swarm. We've got amazing participation. I think that after Barcelona, we will actually expand our participation because getting the word out was a challenge. <laughs> and we were we were getting folks in at the very last minute. The last week, we actually had people join the challenge and demonstrate and actually get things working in just the one week. So huge participation, but it's going to get bigger. The workloads are going are public already in OS Ops tools. <clears throat> uh, we're going to uh, have have the uh, changes reviewed and whatnot. We'll come up with a process to let the vendors know that things need to be retested when changes are made. Uh, and we have, I don't see a dev core. Dev core is collecting the results. And so this will actually also help towards putting this information on the OpenStack uh, web, website. And this is just the collection of the first phase and all the people who made this happen. Uh, actually, this is all the people who made this happen after these guys kicked our butts. <laughs> uh, but you can see we've got a fine start and this will only grow as it becomes more popular and, and more customers ask for this. And this is how we got to where we are today. Back in Austin, uh, IBM, GM threw down the gauntlet. Then Brad got the team together. And Tong got the team working. And the last slide is where we were. <laughs> where we are. <laughs> um, so if you want more information, uh, we do have a nice wiki page, uh, on wiki OpenStack org, Interop Challenge. It's got all the details when we meet, uh, who's been involved, our results. It's a great place to start off and then you can get more information, find our meeting logs, etc. If, uh, you know, looking at our, our workload testing, uh, we did more than, the, than was just demoed uh, yesterday, uh, and we continue to do more. Um, but uh, we, we had a couple different workloads. We had the one that everyone saw yesterday. It was a, a LAMP stack workload with Ansible as the automation. Um, one that we didn't show that a lot of folks have been working on had slightly different characteristics was a, a Docker Swarm app. It was a Docker Swarm gets a swarm um, pods up and running on OpenStack, and it was using a different automation tool called Terraform. Um, and we wanted to test more than one tool. We want to see how the different tools did, see if we ran into issues. Um, Paul Zarkowski's not here. I know Terraform is his beloved tool, but uh, you know Terraform had some trouble working on some clouds. I'm sure they're easily fixed. Uh, you can uh, easily tweak them, but you know, for our results and where we were able to go, the, the Ansible is what, what got us to the 18 different clouds. 
and sometimes you have to dance with the one that uh, brung you, um, <laughs> and that's the one that brung us. So uh, that, that went really well. Um, Tong Lee, who's here in the audience, staying awake, was <laughs> kind enough. Uh, what, one of the things that you know, the analysts had said is, well, we want to see OpenStack run with an enterprise app. We want an enterprise app. And so, you know, Tong went out and, and built an enterprise app uh, with the load balancer, with multiple WordPress nodes, with the database and attached storage, with the security groups. Um, and you can see here on the right, you know, all the different things that were happening. And it was more than that. I mean, if you go look at those scripts, you know, you start with a plain volume, you're, you're, you've you got to put, you know, NFS on it, you got to put uh, the, the database on it, you got the database from the WordPress on it. So uh, a tremendous amount of software installation and configuration, um, in addition to the infrastructure, uh, networking the group rules, the VM provisioning, um, uh, the, the, the attached volume storage, you know, a numerous amounts of stuff was happening in, in this enterprise workload. And, and, and so, you know, thanks, Tong. You put together a very good one. It, it, it kicked a lot of tires from those APIs, uh, the, the DevCore APIs, the RefStack APIs. And, and really gave you that enterprise feel of, um, of an app that uh, you, know, you could feel proud of and call it an enterprise workload. Um, here's one of the very pretty graphics charts. I think actually, I, Joanna Kester's here. She, she made this chart, so thanks, Joanna. Well done. Um, but this is just a nice graphical view uh, key things here is, is a lot of work being done so that uh, even after this is all set up, uh, the only public IP that you can get to is, is, is the one on the load balancer. If you go look in the scripts, you'll see that the other nodes are, are made so that those are not public IPs. So um, I'd like to point out here that th this is an example of a good architecture for an enterprise app. If you start from this, you actually have a lot of the, a lot of your concerns taken care of. Like you said, the load balancer is the one point of entry from the outside. So this is something that would work well and you wouldn't have to uh, do a lot of extra work to secure it. Yep. And, and here's the same very nice picture that Joanna made, and just demonstrating that, and we saw this yesterday on, on stage, running on-prem, dedicated clouds and public clouds, pushing the same workloads, same Ansible modules, uh, little different config files, and, and being able to push those up. And if you want to go see our work, uh, you can go see what this looks like in the repository. Um, uh, the, the, the different uh, workloads that we've put, we've keep putting them in the, in the uh, repository. And you can go check all those out. Um, another neat thing that we did as part of this challenge is people were able to submit results. And this is where DEF Core was huge. They, they, they took it upon themselves to be sort of the, um, the, the, the judge, if you will, the, the traffic cop to say, yeah, yeah, send us your results. Send them into the DEF Core mailing list. We'll keep track of them. We'll record them. But you know, people are able to, to record the results of how things were going. Uh, we had folks running ref stack results. We had how they was going with workload one, which was the lamp stack workload. How were things going with workload two, which was the Docker swarm with Terraform, and uh, you know your name and uh, you know what version of uh, you know we had diff actually had folks using different versions of OpenStack as well. That was a nice variation. So we covered a couple different versions. You're testing uh, backward uh, compatibility there as well. And so thank you to DEF Corps for, for helping to be uh, the responsible adult in the room and, and gather these and keep track of them. Uh, very helpful. Um, so lessons learned. Um, you know, based on our experiences, other people have different opinions, but our experiences, you know, we're all entitled to our own opinions. Um, but the facts are the facts. What we were able to get run on 19 clouds was Ansible and Shade. Um, Shade does a really nice job of handling different characteristics of the different OpenStack clouds and mitigating those and, and, and making that very smooth. And that's, you know, it also plugs into Ansible as an Ansible module. 
Another nice thing about Ansible is a lot of folks do their software config already with Ansible. So you're using the same tool, not just for the automation of the, uh, the infrastructure, but in many cases for what you're using to, to put the software down on the nodes as well. And you know that was a big thing. Um, we had some issues with Terraform uh, not being able to handle certain clouds where they were doing different versioned endpoints. So they gave you two different, two different versions of the Nova service, and when Terraform saw that, it ran for the hills. It screamed, ah! It actually kind of gave an exception. Um, so, you know, there are some issues with Terraform, and as far as we could tell, they weren't being actively addressed, and, uh, you know, a little concern from ourselves that, you know, perhaps that community wasn't actively addressing things as quickly as, say, the Ansible module community was addressing it. You, know, you always go look in Stackalytics for, for the Ansible group and see the variety of uh, the vendors who are the big deployers, the Walmarts, the Comcasts, are, are actively working on the Ansible scripts. So you kind of put all that together and, you know, hey, these other tools may get there, um, but, but they're not there yet in our opinion. Um, another one that, uh, you know, folks like Tong ran into, not all the clouds providing tenant networks by default. Right, so you start out with an easy one and life is good and it's giving you the tenant network and you're ready to go and then you hit the next cloud and that one didn't give that to you. So, uh, right, Tong, we run into a couple bumps there that we had to make sure we understand that maybe you don't always get those and you need to be prepared to configure your own. Um, another fun detail we hit was when you attach the volume storage, the, the default for the volume label, um, it's typically slash dev slash VDB, not always, you know? So that was one of the few things we had to put as a parameter so that you could change it. Um, that, was, that was important. Um, the networking always gets really interesting. Um, um, a couple different things can happen, right? You could have a, a, the private network or the tenant network, um, or you could have the provider network, or maybe the project had multiple tenant networks. Um, there was actually a, Tong did some work and it's best practices in the script where he could do auto detect of whether you have a provider network or a single tenant network. If you have any of those two cases, uh, the, you can look in the scripts and it, it handles that just fine. Uh, the case where you might need to pass in a parameter is if you have multiple tenant networks. Then you've got to at least, you know, tell it, hey, this is the ten tenant network you need to use. And that should make sense, right? It's, you know, we can only do so much, and, you know, the, the scripts aren't psychic. So, you know, if you are only passing one, he'll figure it out. Um, otherwise, you've got to give it a parameter, make it help. Um, again, with, with all this effort, we, we did pretty good running on 18 different, uh, 18 different uh, clouds. And, um, like I said, you can go look at all the scripts and see the very few amount of parameters that they were used to, to handle the, the minor differences between the clouds. Um, so at this point, I'm going to hand back over to Rocky and let her talk about our deliverables. <laughs> uh, so one thing uh, this first bullet points out is that DevCore is changing its name. It will be the interop work group or something close to that. And the for the challenge, step zero for any company that, that wants to participate and get certified in the challenge, they have to pass the def, one of the DEF core guidelines that's currently active. Uh, forgive me, not enough coffee this morning. <laughs> uh, we're working on, the deliverables are vetted enterprise reference apps that you can deploy in a test environment and explore, modify to your own uses. This shortens the, the cycle to actually get, get up and running and being able to deploy in a production environment. The applications all get put into repository as Brad pointed out, we're going to see if we can combine the repositories for the app ecosystem group and this so everyone can find all the different apps 
and be able to access them. Discoverability, we need to make discoverability as easy as possible for our end users and for our vendors. And we're going to work and focus on, on that a bit more. Uh, a number of the bits and pieces that this enterprise, the, the current enterprise app that we demonstrated include load balancer, multiple applica web application nodes, database security groups, block storage. Perhaps going forward, we should maybe add some form of monitoring uh, for testing to make sure the apps remain up and reporting or notification along those lines. But this is a great start. And we're getting feedback from the OpenStack community. Networking is the pain point at the moment. Shade has to be there because there are too many ways to do the same thing in OpenStack. We give you too much choice. Shade helps to fix that. But Shade needs to be expanded to support more of the NFV functions and more, more of the advanced networking functions and the uh, software-defined networking aspects. Ansible is great, but it doesn't unallocate floating IPs. We're going to work with the Ansible OpenStack community to, to deal with that. And then we've got collateral uh, recommendations and best practices. We need to actually write up this beyond just our PowerPoint slides and put it out there on the wiki. Now that we've, now that we've got the work done, we can go and formalize it a bit more so you guys can all find the information that are in these slides, either on the slides or on the wiki. <sighs> Come on. <laughs> uh, and the next, next steps are more apps. We're going to get the Docker Swarm app to a point where the vendors uh, Right now, some vendors can install it and run it, and some can't. And it's a matter of doing the same thing to our scripts that were done for the WordPress LAMP stack app. That is finding out where they break across vendors and putting in those checks and variables and uh, branch statements and whatnot. We've got the Docker Swarm coming up. We have an NFV app that uh, we have working on a couple of vendors already. That's another one that we'll be focusing on. We are, I'm going, going to work with the enterprise work group, and we will get the enterprise work group workload reference architectures included into the interop challenge. They have heat-based apps and Murano-based apps. And for those folks who use those, uh, they'll be able to do that. We're going to formalize this process a bit more so other people can propose apps mm -hmm. and get a nice collection for everybody. We're going to reach out to more vendors and I believe vendors will be reaching out to us. <laughs> and we're going to look at other deployment tools. Juju is a big one. Uh, heat certainly is important. And uh, looking at the user survey, there's a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of folks using that too. And we're going to work more on the network virtualization and getting some good, solid reference design architectures into apps for that so that our community can move forward on that line, too. And this one, come on up. <laughs> yeah, you know, if you participate in the interop challenge, please stand up. Some of you are here. There you go. There's two. Thank you.
Thank you. And we're hoping that uh, we really want to allow time for questions. So anybody have any questions or suggestions? Like we're here, this is where we're going to uh, take suggestions and stuff for the next cycle. Yes, Tom? This one? Yes, Cloud Foundry. That'd be interesting. Yeah. Yes. That was a good suggestion from the previous session. And we actually got them to put, put the uh, link in the uh, Etherpad so we'll be able to contact those people again. <laughs> good. Good. So hopefully we'll see a Cloud Foundry reference workload for Boston? Boston. Yep. See. Any questions, suggestions, otherwise? Come on, guys. <laughs> Is there any app that your customers are clamoring for? How many of you guys actually your vendors how many operators <laughs> okay uh, are there apps or or even suggestions of what other vendors that you guys are working with that aren't part of the interop challenge yet that we should reach out to. Uh, let me go back to that one. Here we go. We've got Reddit, we've got the, the three major uh, Linux distributions. Who else do we need to go reach out to to get on here? Who's missing from our list that you would like to see? <laughs> Nobody, huh? I think that's mine. No. Is it too early in the morning? Did you guys not have enough coffee? Well, I think we got a lot of coverage there. It's, it's hard to find one that's not there. So. That's true. That's true. Uh, so you're happy with, with Cloud Foundry and Docker Swarm for next round? And NFE, yes. And, and, and we're going to have our, our weekly meetings. We'll have more discussion because we're obviously going to want you know broader input from beyond this uh, extensive crowd. Um, we're going to want it from the whole community, so, so we will have those, I'm sure, we'll have the discussions, right? Yep, yeah. and the uh, weekly meetings are at 1400 UTC. Is that mm -hmm. doable for you guys? Good deal. And the first one after this? I don't know, we'll, we'll send out an email. We'll let everybody recover. Oh, also on that, le on, on that issue, um, the mail comes out on the DevCore mailing list. So if you're not subscribed to the DevCore mailing list, yep. please subscribe Good so point. that you can get the mail. And the name of that may change, but if you're subscribed, it will get my, you'll get migrated to the new name mailing list. So. Join the DevCore mailing list. Join the DevCore mailing list. DevCore committee. DevCore committee mailing list. Yeah. Yeah. You go to, to mail info or list.openstack.org, mail list.openstack.org, or mail info at openstack.org, and they have a full list of all the committees, and look for DevCore, and it'll have DevCore plus stuff, 
and just click through on that and subscribe. I think we're pretty much out of time. Cool. Thank you.